Welcome to Move Conversations. In this episode, we talk to Ms. Preeti Sridhar. She's a senior public official and community leader in Seattle area in USA. We are just few weeks from the 2020 US presidential elections. The main theme, keeping it with the times for today is what it takes to run for local elections in the USA. Ms. Preeti ran for office twice in recent years. Before we begin, full disclosure, Preeti and my uh, co-producer Mrigank were classmates in a top ranking specialized business school in India, Indian Institute of Foreign Trade. Preeti, welcome to Move Conversations. Thank you, Venkat. It's wonderful to see you. And hello, Mrigank in the background. So, um, you know, we'll be, we will have uh, two parts to this uh, discussion. First, we would, you know, be focusing on, you know, uh, your background and then, you know, what it takes to run in local elections. And later we will talk about the uh, new social trends that you observe in the uh, sociopolitical trends that you observe in the Indian community. So in the first part, let's begin with uh, what brought you to the USA. So Mrigank, after we graduated from IIFT, I was, uh, uh, you know, looking to launch my career in India. Um, I did uh, get a job uh, soon after I worked with uh, HCL, the Hindustan Computers Limited. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, interestingly, even though the Indian economy had opened up to uh, women in management, it was still very slow. If you remember, you know, we few women in the IIFT class sure. held a very, very, you know, kind of coveted position because we were a handful and the rest of you were all guys. <laughs> and I remember even as I was interviewing for jobs, even, you know, large corporations like Pons India told me you can get a job, but you need uh, an MBA in finance because we don't give the jobs in marketing to women. So I really came to the US to pursue an MBA and an MBA in finance. Um, I got a scholarship. And so I decided that I would, you know, get that one, you know, one little thing that was uh, missing in my resume to get an MBA degree in finance. And mm -hmm. Um, that is uh, what brought me here. I will say that even before doing that, I did break some uh, boundaries because my one year internship with uh, HCL uh, was a first because I was the first woman who was a management intern uh, selling uh, or working in the marketing department to uh, work in their busy bee uh, sector uh, with what was then called MS DOS. Right, right. I don't know if right, anyone right, remembers yeah, yeah, that yeah. anymore. Right, 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 right. Awesome. So, you know, since then, um, you know, you moved and uh, it was very interesting to see that you, uh, you worked for a long time with the government or public service in the USA. So what has been that experience like? Like what kind of jobs did you do over the years in the US public service? Great, I, and I, I, love the, I love the fact that you use the word jobs because mm -hmm. I think uh, to me that that's really been what's been most exciting mm -hmm. um, in, uh, in my, my, uh, my life and my journey. Uh, my, my first opportunity was private sector. I, I had the you know, singular pleasure of working in Manhattan, downtown Manhattan, a few blocks from the Empire State Building. Mm -hmm. But then very soon after, as soon as I moved to Seattle, it's been public sector. And I, and I really like to say public service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I, I really cherish my work there. Um, and uh, I've had a whole lot of different uh, opportunities and careers. And firstly, uh, what, I, what I like to say is that, uh, you know, there is a stereotype that one thinks of when you think of government. Right. You think of slow, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. you think of dark, you know, kind of uh, these old, boring, I think the word slow, boring, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and where nothing moves and nothing happens mm -hmm. are kind of the, the images that come to your mind. Mm -hmm. And what I have to say is the jobs I have done mm -hmm. have been the most exciting and the most life changing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I've done things, I mean, I'll, I'll get to the big picture in just a second, mm -hmm. but my jobs have been so exciting. I've been on the media, mm -hmm. I've brought film festivals to the world, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been on crime scenes. Wow. You know, so when you think, when I think of the, you know, I would, come home every day from work and I wouldn't stop talking and my eyes would light up and say, you know what I did today? <laughs> I spoke to the kid who was on American Idol. Wow. You know, I was there when, uh, you know, we, I spoke to a celebrity who was on a film festival. Mm -hmm. I made a decision that would get people 10 years of water. Right. So, so I will say that, you know, jobs, is, I was in a parade, you know? Uh -huh. So, so jobs is a nice way of saying it, but, but I think what's, you know, kind of beyond that, what's been really great is when you're in the public sector, first of all, you are accountable right. and you are measuring what you're doing mm -hmm. in terms of the difference that you make to people and the community. And the impact of what you do is long-term. Right. Um, and, and then, so your entire focus on things is very different. Mm -hmm. And, and if you were now going to say, well, you started saying marketing and finance and where is all that? Mm -hmm. Um, and that was kind of an aha moment for me, because firstly, let me tell you, I never liked finance. I hated <laughs> finance. So I, do, did you go there because uh, Pons uh, recommended that, that that will be the job you can get as a yes. woman in that and time? So when I started doing finance in my MBA, I found that what I really liked was marketing. Sure. And I found myself doing a few extra courses in marketing and getting a minor in marketing. I must confess yeah. that like I, you know, you last, last thing you look like in, in our class was a finance person. So, so I, I was surprised I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, that you, I took, just, you specialize yeah. in finance, right? Yeah, I, I think I liked the finance professor, but I did not like <laughs> the um, and, um, and, you know, in fact, I, I really liked, you know, those days, Philip Kotler was like the guru of uh, marketing. And, you know, I learned his book, uh, Upside Down, Inside Out. And, and then what was very interesting when I got into the public sector and the world of environmental and social marketing mm -hmm. was this very interesting idea mm -hmm. of when, you know, marketing is all about behavior change and consumer marketing is about how you get people to change behavior to buy what right. you want. Right. And social marketing is about telling people how to not consume excess. Right, right. And that was kind of the field I found myself getting into. Awesome, awesome. Hey, Priti, I remember you mentioning that you wrote a chapter in uh, Philip Kotler's book, didn't you not? Yes. Did you not? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. So that was Wonderful. obviously yeah. a crowning glory for absolutely, me. Absolutely, absolutely. We can only dream of, right? Yes. Um, so, so, you know, that the, those were my jobs that, like I said, that I got to do, but really all that went on to, you know, some kind of really amazing moments where, um, you know, from in the public sector, I got to uh, specialize a lot in, in the environment. And so uh, some of my uh, really wonderful moments were uh, when I was in Seattle, um, you know, we've all heard about uh, the former Vice President Al Gore mm -hmm. and his movie, An Inconvenient Truth. Mm -hmm. And I actually had the privilege of bringing him to Seattle to launch the, his um, premiere presentation of the movie before it was a movie, when it wow. was the slideshow mm -hmm. with Laurie David. And uh, so we brought that to Seattle and we launched the Seattle Climate Protection Initiative, mm 
This was during the George Bush administration when the U.S. would not sign on to the Kyoto Protocol. Correct. And uh, so that was my, uh, you know, work with the former mayor of Seattle. Um, I, you know, and from something as uh, amazing as that to a few years before that, really teaching the community how to recycle um, and, uh, you know, conservation programs here. Um, and then, um, you know, I've done consulting work to, with Jordan and India on uh, water and environmental programs. And then some of my most recent work, which I find very, very critical and important is the work on social justice, race, and um, uh, especially with work related to the African uh, American community and public safety and police. Mm -hmm. And it's work that I'm continuing to do because it's, it's really something that is at the core of what's happening uh, you know, in America today with uh, you know, government policies and issues. So you have been always been uh you know, uh, particular and keen about uh, social issues, uh, ecological issues, community issues, and so on. Uh, so it, it comes now as, a, you know, not a surprise that you are interested in, you know, uh, serving the public, not only from as a public servant, but also as a, you know, in public offices, if there are elected offices. But, you know, talking of uh, elected public offices, to me, as an outsider, it appears that it's somewhat unique in the USA that there is a whole bunch of top public offices. I mean, the ones that we hear about are those of, you know, public prosecutors and, uh, you know, in your case, we heard about uh, port commissioners and so on to which people are elected to. That's not common in, you know, uh, many countries. Tell us what offices in the US, maybe cities and states are typically elected positions. I mean, we are everywhere in the world or like most countries of the world, mayors and governors are elected officers, but leaving aside those, what in other places we think is a, you know, a career uh, bureaucrats job becomes a elected office in the USA. So, so there are many offices. Um, at the same time, I will also say that not a lot of them get the same um, recognition um, and nor do they get the same interest level as the usual suspects. Okay. Um, basically, any uh, position that is either f ha that has control over taxpayer dollars mm -hmm. or has to make decisions that involve public decision making. Right. So it could be a school board, right. because those are oftentimes you know, the, the public schools are using public funds. They might be funded by property taxes. It could be, there are water commissioners. Mm -hmm. And this is really interesting because, you know, we all take water for granted, but at the same time, it is such a critical, basic, uh, you know, public amenity. And there right. are decisions made for, I mean, I think in India sometimes, in fact, there was a movie a long time ago in Tamil Nadu called Tanir Tanir, right. which was about, you know, basic, you know, water exactly. uh, uh, resource. So the water commissioners, fire district commissioners, uh, like you said, uh, attorney generals, uh, prosecutors, uh, local judges, a lot of these positions are elected office. Mm -hmm. In addition, mm -hmm. of course, to the state legislators who are both House representatives and, you know, senators, uh, and then council, city council members, and uh, mayors. So there's, right. there's a lot of different uh, offices that come up for election. Very interesting. I mean, it's something that uh, outside of USA, in most countries, we don't, uh, you know, or uh, we are not aware of. Right. So uh, coming to your experience, you ran uh, twice for Seattle Port Commissioner's job. Um, why that position? You know, what motivated you? Um, very interesting. So the in Seattle, the uh, you know the port commissioner's position manages the uh, the Seattle uh, airport. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. the Seattle port and the cruise terminal. And it's a, it's a very, very important position. Uh, the operating budget of the port is almost a billion dollars. It's not quite, mm -hmm. but almost a billion dollars. Um, the, the port of Seattle is 107 years old. Uh, the, the Seattle airport, the SeaTac airport is the eighth busiest airport in the country. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yet this position, this commission and all these facts are almost invisible. Mm. Almost nobody knows about it. Mm -hmm. In this, uh, you know, over hundred year history, there have been only five women who have served as port commission, no women of color. And uh, uh, like I said, it's, it's something that's kind of invisible. Almost no one knows about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's hardly any attention given to this, uh, you know, this position. Mm -hmm. What got me interested is it's, it's almost like a, a headline story. So what happened was on uh, January 27th, 2017, uh, because of the Syria crisis, mm -hmm. um, the federal government, Fred, uh, President Donald Trump, he signed an executive order mm -hmm. banning seven predominantly Muslim countries from flying into the U.S. True. And as a result of this executive order, there were several repercussions. Mm. There were huge impacts you know, economic impacts, impacts to families. Um, and among a variety of things that happened, you know, people who couldn't get back, people who were stranded, even people with green cards who mm -hmm. had, you know, who were suddenly couldn't go back home, couldn't see their families. True. But on a very, very basic level, the impact to our community here in Seattle was huge. Right. Emirates, which is one of our, uh, you know, signature airlines that operates out of SeaTac. Right. Not to mention that for the Indian community, Emirates being a very important airline because it's a hub that takes us to Dubai and then to the Bombay dream. and every right. other place. They right. had to cancel one of their uh, flights, daily flights. So the, the impact of that was huge. Um, Seattle's attorney general, mm -hmm. a gentleman called Bob Ferguson, um, he sued the federal government on behalf of not just Seattle, but all the attorneys saying, you know, this, this is wrong. You cannot do that. Right. And that same day, there was actually a huge protest at SeaTac. And soon after that, uh, you know, there's, there's a sequence of events, but soon after that, there was actually a port commissioner who decided not to seek re-election. Okay. And I said then, for all these other reasons, I also just mentioned to you about the impact of True. the port. I said, you know, I never really had any uh, interest in running for politics because I don't need a, you know, strobe light on my face. But for these other reasons, I said, someone needs to take action. And even though this is not necessarily a very, um, you know, a, a, a seat that gets attention, it, mm -hmm. it has impact. Right. And I'm going to run. Right. So when you announced that you're going to run, how did your family react? And what was the you know, experience of running for an election in the USA like? So, so, you know, my family is a very interesting family. Um, they, they, my family is here in the U.S. My immediate family is here in the U.S. Um, that said, I am a single mother. And, and I faced some of those challenges, you know, as an individual. So my family is liberal. They are very, you know, they've been very supportive. But in some ways, they're, they're not kind of, uh, you know, they're, they're conservative in sense of, they don't want a lot of attention. True. Um, and it. so, you know, and they realize that standing for office, you're, you're kind of standing there asking, asking for trouble. <laughs> and uh, and you know, spotlight. <laughs> and the spotlight. 
So, so there was a little bit of, are you sure you want to do this? You already have a, you know, 50 hour work week, uh, but we'll support you, you know? So that, that was really the reaction. They knew that I'm the one who always stands up, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, they were there to support me, but they wanted to caution me saying, are you sure you, you know, you've already taken up so much. You've got right. a kid. Is right. this what you want to do? Right. Right. So, so what, you know, uh, I guess you have to raise money to contest an election. So what was that experience, you know, uh, ra raising money, uh, you know, campaigning, how easy was it or how difficult was it to, you know, raise money as an immigrant uh, or a naturalized American, as a woman of color? So, you know, there, there are multiple issues to uh, contesting an election uh, public for a public office anywhere in the world and definitely in, 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 in the USA. That was is the hardest part. Right. Um, so several parts of that. Uh, I mean, and you really hit the nail on the head. Um, first of all, you know, um, the, you know, people who, uh, who have been here, um, you know, they, uh, who have the, the, the family support, the generations of support, um, you know, they, have uh, um, it's much easier for them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the Indian South Asian Indian community is more likely to give for charitable causes, especially mm -hmm. for charitable causes in India. Right. You know the the village that needs help. Um, I uh, you know. I don't have that base, mm -hmm, so it was mm -hmm. much harder. Mm. Um, and uh, and I'm, I don't have that personality to go out there and say, "Hey, you know, <laughs> you know, give me, give me money." Um, it was not a visible race. It's an insignificant. It's, it's important, but nobody knew about it. Right. It was not a partisan race, so much more difficult to. You know, get people excited saying, let's get the other side. There right. really wasn't another side, you know. Right. Um, and then on top of it all, you're looking, I was facing the same time I had other races where there were other Indian women mm -hmm. where they were very highly contested other races. Right. First time in the history of the Washington state that you were going to flip the Senate. Right, right. So right, it was right. like, we'd love to give, but we have to give, we have only so much we have to give the other person because uh, that's a critical race in the history of our state. Right. So it was difficult. Yeah, it was absolutely. Yeah, very absolutely. challenging. What was my dream? Not to be stuck in an arranged marriage, but to get a scholarship and to come to America. I found my dream in King County where I raised my son and worked for the public for 27 years. I launched Seattle's Climate Protection Initiative with Al Gore. My dream is to make the port a world leader and protect its environment. Please vote for me, Preeti for Port, and let's protect what we love about our home. Paid for by Preeti for Port. Pretty, you just mentioned that, like you know, when you ran for office, there were other women of South East, uh, South Asian origin, right, uh, who also ran for other offices in 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 your area. So I guess this was 2017, right, when there were like seven other women of uh, South Asian origin, and uh, you know they ran for different offices in the Seattle area. What was the response of the local community like, right? Did they have heavy turnouts? What, 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 what happened? I mean, give us a sense of like, how, how does it work and what happens? Yeah, um, it was interesting. It was actually, I would say mixed. Um, so for example, uh, one of the women who was running at that time um, is, uh, you know, pretty, pretty well known. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, she is a South Asian Indian uh, council member in Seattle. And uh, at that time, actually, there was a very controversial issue on the 
under discussion. It was, uh, this person was uh, trying to change the minimum wage for workers to okay. a $15 minimum wage. And oh, yeah. Seattle was one of the first to do it, if not the first, right? Yes, yes, uh, it was. And uh, the person uh, has uh, a lot of people who, um, you know, either uh, are followers or immensely dislike her. Oh, okay. So, and, uh, you know, unfortunately for members of the community, all Indians look alike. Mm -hmm. So I've actually been, I was accosted twice during okay. the race. Once at a parking lot at a grocery store and once at a cafe when I was, uh, you know, um, sitting with my campaign manager. So it was, was uh, you know, with potential bodily harm. Oh my God. So that was scary. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, as I mentioned to you, uh, there was also, you know, this whole challenge with just trying to differentiate myself with potential donors and getting money. Right. On the other hand, there was also, I would say, this great opportunity because suddenly there were, you know, there was this coming together of the community. I found myself getting attention, being called for events. I think one thing that was fantastic that happened, it actually happened later on, but um, there was a traveling exhibit of the Smithsonian that came to Seattle. And uh, I, I got a centerpiece, uh, um, uh, you know, Orange. exhibit and naming and recognition of that. Right. So, um, I mean, I, I, think, uh, I think in many ways there were both good things and bad things that happened from, I, I won't call the bad thing, I won't take that seriously, but, right. but right. I definitely think that overall it's been, you know, wonderful that so many of us, you know, took uh, the opportunity and, you know, and, and ran for office. So, so that would mean that like you would have got uh, support from, you know, across uh, people from different uh, segments of the, you know, of the Seattle area, right? Uh, Absolutely. King, King County where you are from, right? Absolutely. And, and then the other thing I do want to say is that mine was the only race amongst all the races that was across the county. Right. Some of the other women who ran, even even the congresswoman who ran, right. were smaller districts. So mine was uh -huh. the one race that was much larger in scope. So, right. so that was also pretty wonderful. So do these elections have heavy turnouts or uh, people don't um, uh, pay much, much attention? Know, How does it work? Percentage, uh, the primaries usually have less turnout. Mm -hmm. um, Understandable. And, uh, but I got a hundred, almost, I think it was like 99,000 votes for my 2017 race. Wow. So that was pretty good. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. It's really, really awesome. So you did mention that uh, your position uh, and the contest was not along party lines while some of the others were there. So I, I think that was also reflected uh, in, in what I saw, you know, your uh, debate. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that you had. I, I saw the clipping of that on local Fox channels and uh, looked very civil to me. So, you know, pretty unlike what we see, uh, you know, in the 2016 or 2020 presidential elections. So how come, how does, how does that happen? I mean, that, that America also exists for us. Let us know. Um, so my 2000 campaign, 2017 campaign was very civil. Mm -hmm. uh, my, in fact, uh, the person with whom I, you know, I made it uh, to the primary, uh, he would, uh, he, he termed me his co-candidate, wow. which was, so we were on very friendly terms. And as it happened, it was, like I said, nonpartisan. And we both shared uh, very many of the same values. I noticed and, that. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, th I think we had slight differences in approaches, slight differences in priorities. I, I think, uh, you know, I had a very strong game plan. Mm -hmm. I was very strong on environment and in inclusion and equity. Um, and he had a slightly different approach on some of those issues. Right. So yes, it was a more civil uh, 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 campaign. 
um, and uh, um, you know, 2019 was a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, yes, so it can happen that way. There are local races that are not that civil mm -hmm. that can be uh, you know negative. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm very glad. I I still actually have fond memories of my 2017 campaign. Right. Um, obviously, if they are on partisan lines, they can be ugly. They can be right. negative. Right. Um, and uh, how was 2019? 2019 was not my favorite experience. Okay. Um, the reason it was not my favorite experience was um, it was politics played. Okay. And it had Sad. almost nothing to do with me. Mm. It was politics that were played due to other players and other races. Okay. Okay. Um, the other thing that was for me very interesting in 2019 was it was a reflection of, you know, what we're seeing today in okay. the, in, in our, uh, you know, in our greater community. Right. Right. Uh, you know, there was a big change in um, what we're seeing with our, uh, uh, with our public. Okay. Um, the, there was a huge, there was a lot of impatience in, um, you know, our uh, community. And, and I have to say, rightly so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think our, our, uh, our public is demanding answers. Right. Right. But in some ways, because of that, there's an impatience. Um, and some of that is because, you know, as elected officials, we haven't delivered. Right, right. And but, so, but, you know, one thing I noticed that, like, you got endorsement support from different mayors of, uh, you know, your city, neighboring cities, sports stars endorsing you. So, yes. so, you, you, so you're a celebrity there, right? I, uh, yes, yes, I uh, thank you. Um, but, but, you know, it comes down to, like I said, um, you know, we have a sm smaller turnout mm -hmm, for, mm -hmm. uh, for the primary elections. Um, we do have, I think, a small group of uh, people who are, um, you know, they want answers and they want answers today. There's an impatience in our community Right. Um, I mean, look at our elections. Uh, we have so many people who supported Hillary Clinton. She did not win. We have True. so many people who supported Bernie Sanders. He did not win. So, so there is a polarization in our community. Uh, I had many supporters, mm. but at the same time, mm. it was a surprise, you know. Right. Um, so uh, it, it was hard to take the fact um, there were some switches in decisions, um, but at the same time, when I think about it, I think the, the port is going through a hard time. There were some very, very serious decisions that, you know, were facing the port, not to mention the fact that today it's even more complicated with COVID, with the cruise industry stopping, with the airline industry coming to a standstill, right. with restaurants all coming to a standstill. And all these are impacting the port in very, very huge ways. Right, absolutely, so, absolutely, we get that, right. That's a you know, uh, nice uh, place where we could uh, end the first part of the conversation and uh, uh, you know, we would, uh, you know, kind of uh, some of the things that you mentioned also leads us to uh, to the next part, which we, uh, you know, on the how the Indian community has been a community under transformation over over many decades, and uh, we would talk about that uh, in the in the next segment. So, viewers, don't go away. We'll be back in a minute with part two.